financial markets in turmoil. What are the root causes of the financial crisis? The dollar losing value. Heading for its biggest loss in nearly three decades. Will Social Security even be there? I don't know. Buy or rent? That's a very good question. Interest rates? I'm not so sure. Where do you put your money? I don't know. Welcome to the show that answers your questions. This is Follow the Money Weekly with your host, economist and best-selling author, here's Jerry Robinson. Well, friends, welcome to you all around the world. Welcome to Follow the Money Radio. So grateful to have you here along for the ride. We have a good show for you today. The title of today's podcast episode is Inflation is Here. <laughs> Unless you've been living under a rock for the past few months, you know that prices are rising. It really doesn't matter which direction that you look. You know, rising commodity prices are putting pressure on companies. We see rising shipping costs. If you're at all dealing with any kind of shipping, you're seeing big increases in the price of shipping. Uh, freight costs, lumber costs, steel costs. We have tight inventories of materials, even semiconductors, which is actually somewhat of a different uh, reason. It's not really attached fully to the concept of inflation here. But lumber, uh, as I had mentioned, cotton, so much so that many businesses are already announcing that they're going to need to raise prices based upon some of the earnings reports that we have seen from companies in Q1. Take a look at stock prices. Those two are just soaring all-time record highs. You know, when you look at the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, many of these major indices are just at all-time highs. Real estate prices are through the roof and well beyond the price level seen before the 2008 housing bust. You know, inflation, many people get confused about what inflation is. And many people think that, well, when prices rise or when the cost of something goes up, that that is what is inflation. But in our book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, I spend some time explaining what inflation is. And I'm actually going to read you the definition that we provide in the back of our book, in the glossary for the word inflation. We say inflation is an increase in the quantity of money that is not offset by a corresponding increase in the need for money. So in essence, what inflation is, is it is an inflation of what? It is an inflation of the monetary base, right? So the amount of money that you have in the economy, when you increase that, when you add more money, then you create what is known as inflation. Now, it doesn't always translate into higher prices immediately. You can inflate the monetary base and it may take a little bit of time before you begin to see that inflation creep. That also depends a little bit on the velocity of money. We won't get into velocity today on this particular podcast. We're not going to get too geeky on this podcast with inflation. But what I want to talk about is really how inflation is a stealth tax, right? So the monetary authorities, when they create more dollars, well, it basically dilutes the value of the existing monetary base, right? So when the government dilutes the value of the existing monetary base by printing more dollars, that is what we call inflation. Inflation is a stealth tax. It's a hidden tax upon our common currency. You know, inflation is a tax upon those who trust in their currency to hold a stable value. And over the course of time, it takes a dollar to buy what a nickel used to buy. You know, it's a very similar concept to if you're familiar with st how stocks work and secondary offerings and new share issuances by publicly traded companies. When a number of available shares that a company offers goes up, the value of all outstanding shares is diluted in their strength, which makes them less valuable. That's why a stock will often fall in price, sometimes significantly, on news of a new share offering. But once the government dilutes the monetary supply by creating more of the currency, it leads to too many dollars chasing too few goods, which is the classic recipe for inflation. And as the price of goods begins to rise, merchants attempt to pass those rising costs on to their customers. And eventually, employees demand wage increases to keep up with the rising costs, which leads to another price hike for consumers and so on. And it evokes the old wage price spiral. Some people call it the price wage spiral that we really saw in the 1970s. It's an old macroeconomic term. I taught a course in macroeconomics, and I remember teaching this concept uh, very well. 
But the idea, of course, in, uh, mo- in macroeconomics with the price wage spiral is that you have this inflation of the monetary supply. Of course, prices rise as a result because there's more dollars and and still fewer goods. And so the price of everything goes up. And then as the price of everything goes up, workers who can't afford what they used to be able to afford demand wage increases. The employers raise wages. And when they do, they have to pass on those rising costs or they choose to pass on those rising costs to their customers. And so then they have to raise prices by doing that. And that just leads to this vicious cycle. And that's What has some investors concerned here, we saw a little bit of this going on uh, this week with Jerome Powell really trying to calm the markets and explain that there's probably not going to be anything in the way of our interest rate hike out till 2023, 2024. But then U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen also this week made the comment that inflation was very likely a problem here in the United States, and the government or the Federal Reserve would have to raise interest rates to deal with that inflation. So it led to a conflicting message, almost like two captains of a ship. And so it confused the markets uh, briefly. Janet Yellen immediately came out and denied that she was calling for immediate interest rate hikes or that, you know, it was needed now or anything like that. We'll see if that works. The market seems to have stabilized since that uh, moment. But the point is, is that You know, we are certainly in an environment where inflation is here. It's not just coming. It's here. And of course, we we're not going to really spend time discussing the morality or the we should say the immorality of our present monetary system. Perhaps we should save that for another day. But if you look at the latest round of corporate earnings, it paints a picture of the reality of this rising inflation. According to a report by the Bank of America Global Research, the number of mentions of the word inflation during Q1 earnings calls has exploded, more than tripling year over year per company so far. And the biggest jump in the word inflation as far as the number or the occurrence in these earnings calls since Bank of America started keeping records back in 2004, right? And so that same Bank of America report goes on to point out that a robust rebound in inflation is certainly ahead. One of the world's most richest investors as well knows that inflation is here. Warren Buffett and his sidekick Charlie Munger are the founders of Berkshire Hathaway, and each year the company hosts its annual shareholder meeting in Omaha, Nebraska. I always enjoy reviewing the highlights of the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. But during this meeting, Mr. Buffett was asked about inflation and what he thought about rising inflation in 2021. And here was an excerpt of his answer. Let's roll the tape. We're seeing very substantial inflation. It's very interesting. I mean, it, it, we're raising prices. People are raising prices to us. Uh, and it's being accepted. I mean, it's not, uh, if we get, you know, take home building. I mean, uh, you know, the cost of, we've got nine home builders and uh, in addition to our manufactured housing thing and then uh, operation, which is the largest in the country. So we really do a lot of housing. <laughs> uh, the costs are just up, up, up. Steel costs, uh, you know, just every day, uh, they're, they're going up. So one of the world's richest men, one of the top investors in the world, admitting that, yes, inflation is here. If you've been doing any kind of building projects at all, you see the price of lumber, the price of steel, the price of so many different input costs rising and rising sharply. And again, I mentioned also shipping costs, container shipping costs, for example. From November to February, the cost of shipping a 40-foot container from Asia to Europe rose by more than threefold. If you look at the price of shipping goods from North America to Asia, you'll see that that price has doubled uh, in recent months. And if you look at the Freydos Baltic Index, which is a measure of container freight rates at 12 important maritime lanes, that has increased from around $2,200 to $4,000 per container. That was according to a February report put out by The Economist. Those prices have eased a little bit since that time. But these high shipping costs, the way these things work is the high shipping costs for businesses get sealed into contracts for the next 12 months. So these companies are forced to pay the extra costs on consumers. So anybody who was you know, uh, locking in these shipping costs earlier this year, they're going to have some pretty stout shipping costs that they're going to have to pass on to consumers. 
and costs are rising because the soaring demand created by coordinated fiscal and monetary policies through easy money and stimulus checks and handouts to big corporations, right? Plus, you also have a general shortage of if ships, you have a, a general shortage of dock workers, and then you have a shortage of truckers. Well, you've got a lot of strong demand here. you got backlog ports. You have uh, really what is a recipe for rising prices. Trucking, freight rates, all passed on to the business, which will ultimately materialize in the form of higher consumer prices. And that's what we're seeing today. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And if you, by the way, if you're single and you need a job and you can drive a truck or you can learn and you want to see the country, there's probably a trucking job available for you right now. There's a report out put out by a trucking industry group, I believe, entitled Trucker Driver Shortage in the U.S. to Further Deepen by 2026. And I quote, there are approximately about 63,000 truck driving jobs in the bulk tanker market that are vacant today. And the global tanker trucks market size is predicted to need 174,000 new truckers by 2026. They're having a hard time replacing current workers. And typically truckers tend to be a little older than the, you know, than the average worker. And so they're having a hard time replacing these truckers because a lot of young workers want to work inside indoor environment. They want a computer. They want access to the internet. They want to be, you know, they don't want to work with their hands, so to speak. They don't want to get into a truck and drive a truck, but there's plenty of jobs in these areas for those who are looking for the for a job. You know, commodity prices, which have long slumbered amid deflationary concerns, have really been awakened since the pandemic. And we saw that commodity prices immediately contracted and then surged. And we've been tracking the trends in commodities for our members here at Follow the Money for many years. And we can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that the commodities bull market is already here. You know, this bull market in commodities is supported by a weakening U.S. dollar. You know, the total supply of America's currency has been diluted at historic levels, and interest rates have been artificially suppressed by monetary policymakers. The price of raw materials and parts have just soared as suppliers and shippers have struggled to keep up with a sharp increase in demand. And as I had stated to you, building costs just soaring over the last year. As we have a great migration here in the United States and a disruption of the real estate markets, which again has been supported by the Fed's easy money policies, and it sparked a growing wave of demand leading to a frenzy in home building and remodeling projects, which is putting pressure on lumber prices, which by the way are through the roof. Uh, steel prices, as I mentioned, keep rising. Copper prices just keep rising. And it's not just building products, it's grain prices, corn at its highest level since 2013. Uh, oil prices on the rise, right? The uptrends are completely intact, and the path to higher prices is much more likely uh, as we head into the near term. I'm just going to run down and give you some examples here. I'm looking at our uh, members-only page, our PACE report. It's our PACE model ETF portfolio, where we alert our members when commodities enter new uptrends. And so we will send them, if you're a member here at Follow the Money, you will receive the commodity and the ETF that we're using to track it and the date that the uptrend begins. So we alert you when an uptrend begins in one of these commodities. Let me give you a few examples here. I'm looking at the page for our members. Rare earth metals, which certainly qualify as commodities, which we track with the ticker symbol REMX. We called an uptrend on rare earth metals on May 29th of 2020, right? That has been almost a year ago as of this podcast. Since that time, rare, that Rare Earth Metals ETF, REMX, soared 144%, right? That's enormous, enormous rally. Solar Energy, ticker symbol TAN, which I actually own shares of TAN, that one has gone up 138% since May 8th when we called the uptrend alert. Uranium, we called a new uptrend alert on the ticker symbol URA on April 24th of 2020. Uh, about a year later, it's up 98%. We called an uptrend on lithium miners using the ticker symbol LIT. That one has gone up 133%. And it's not just those. Water is up 48% since May. Uh, the ETF we track for that, our commodities ETF that we track, DBC, is up 46% since July. And we can just go on and on here. Platinum, base metals, oil, we called an uptrend in December. It's already up nearly 40%. We use the ticker symbol DBO. Uh, agriculture, DBA, up about 31%. And it, we believe agriculture is probably just getting started here in this current environment. So as I state, the uptrends are intact and the path to higher prices, we believe, uh, is much more likely as we move ahead. And the Fed admits as much. 
Uh, just last week, Fed Chair Jerome Powell declared that the current and coming inflationary pressures, he calls them transitory. And the Fed loves to use big words. So put simply, Mr. Powell is saying that the phenomenon of rising consumer costs, which he believes is what inflation is, will be temporary and not permanent. And we'll have to see. But companies like Nestle and Colgate Palmolive aren't waiting around to see if these are temporary price increases. They're already beginning to raise prices. And so you're going to see this at the grocery store if you haven't already. You know, you're going to continue to see these companies having to pass on these rising input costs and shipping costs and all of these other things to the, the end user, to the customer. Now, don't forget something and why inflation could become more of a problem than perhaps we may realize this year and even into next year. It, it could be transitory. The Fed could be right. We may see this. We may see a peak and then an you know, kind of an ebb. We, we may actually see the, the inflation rate begin to pull back. But there's a concern here. And I don't want you to forget that the Federal Reserve adopted a new framework last summer that was highly significant for decades. Uh, Federal Reserve policymakers sought to cut off inflation at the pass because they knew there was something known as the lag factor. So in monetary policy, it is well known that these policy decisions made by these central banks don't create the desired impact immediately. But instead, once the central bank issues a new policy, it can take months for the new policy to achieve its intended purpose. Therefore, until last summer, the Federal Reserve always attempted to preempt rising bouts of inflation by raising interest rates before the official inflation rate hit their target level, which they state is 2%. Well, last summer, the Fed changed this decades-old approach, and now instead has stated that they will actually allow the official inflation figures to exceed their 2% annual inflation target for some unknown period of time before they would ever consider raising interest rates. And so this means that the Fed may let inflation run hot above its target rate of 2% for an unknown period of time. Who knows? You know, months, weeks, we don't know. Uh, before they would begin to step in. And the Fed has also said that they plan to taper before they actually begin hiking interest rates. What that means is that currently the Fed is buying about $120 billion worth of bonds, mortgage-backed securities and government bonds, uh, every single month. And what the Fed has said that they're going to do as a sig market signal to uh, investors is that they'll begin to taper what they're buying in bonds before they begin to raise interest rates. You know, right now, we know that the inflation rate is running higher than 2%. It's just common sense. And then on top of that, we have the data to back it up. But the problem is, is how long is the Fed going to let this occur before they begin to step in? And here's the problem. The reason why the stock market is just taking off is largely due, obviously, there's economic optimism. Obviously, there's an economic reopening that's been going on. Obviously, there's the vaccine which is helping further with the economic reopening. But there's also a lot of moral hazard. There's a lot of recklessness. There's a lot of speculation. And so many people have stepped into the stock market. In fact, 41% of U.S. households now have exposure to the stock market. And while that should sound good, because it's historically been much lower than that, we've seen a big influx of investors this year into the stock market. While that should sound good, the problem is, is that it's largely been created through these easy money policies that are sending stock prices really high, right? So every time the stock market catches a cold the or even gets the flu, the Federal Reserve steps in as if to say that's not allowed. Like the stock market can't get sick. You know, it just can't. I mean, the, the Fed will step in and start pumping up the bubble again and again and again. And you wonder how, how healthy is this? And I think that's the problem here is that we're going to have, of course, another big crash in the stock market. We had a crash in 2000. We should all remember it. We had a crash in 2008. We should all remember it. And then we had a crash in 2020, which was really not directly related to the, you know, to the excessive amounts of speculation in the market. It was due to a public health crisis. And so now with the historic amount of monetary policy, the historic amount of fiscal policy that's been put in uh, or been enacted in the uh, United States, you know, we now have prices of stocks and real estate and many other assets and now commodities and everything and cryptocurrencies. We haven't even brought that up. We just see this general elevation in prices that's just unsustainable, right? So we are going to have to deal with that. And the Fed at some point will have to stop dousing the market 
with cheap money. It's going to have to start raising interest rates. And what that's going to look like is going to be difficult to see. How quickly they're going to need to raise interest rates is just not certain. They claim that they're going to wait till 2023, 2024, but the Fed may not have that luxury, right? Because if inflation begins to run really hot before that time, they really won't have a choice but to raise interest rates or face, you know, a spiraling inflation, which could cause even more problems. So it's a really interesting situation that we're in. We've never really been in an environment like this where we have seen so much accommodation, so much accommodation from the Fed, so much accommodation not only from the United States Central Bank, but all over the world. Uh, we've seen a tremendous amount of liquidity pumped into the system. And then, of course, we see the fiscal policymakers here in the United States, you know, providing a lot of accommodation. And so how long uh, we can continue to expect this kind of easy money is anyone's guess. But we do know that inflation is going to be something that the policymakers are keeping their eye on. And as an individual out there who is trying to save and invest for retirement, inflation is one of the biggest, biggest drags upon your finances. It's an eroding factor on money. And so what I want to do now is I want to just take a quick break. We'll come back and I want to talk to our good friend and longtime financial advisor, Mike Mitchell. He's a part of our Christian advisor referral. And I want to talk to Mike about some ideas of how one can prepare themselves for a time of rising inflation. We're certainly in a time now of rising inflation. We don't know how high it will go. We don't know how well the Federal Reserve will be able to keep and contain this from getting out of control. But what we do know is that individuals, we want to take proactive steps to protect our nest egg, to protect our retirement plans, uh, to, re to protect the resources that we have been entrusted with. And so on the other side of this break, we'll be joined by Mike Mitchell, and we'll talk about how you can protect yourself from rising inflation. Well, joining me on the line again today is our good friend and longtime financial advisor. He's a part of our Christian Advisor Referral. It's Mike Mitchell. Hey, Mike, great to have you on the line today. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely, Jerry. It's great to hear from you and, and, and good to be on the program with you. Absolutely. Well, we've been talking on today's podcast all about the topic of inflation. And we see rising mm -hmm. inflation. Of course, we've seen an incredible rise in the amount of money the actual money supply has just risen and mushroomed since the mm -hmm. pandemic took hold back in early 2020. The response to it by the Fed has been nothing short of Herculean. I mean, it's been incredible. Mm. Then you have the fiscal right. monetary policy, the fiscal policy, the monetary policy. And so now we're beginning to see the effects of this. Of course, we've seen rising prices across the board. But Mike, many investors now and those who are trying to prepare for retirement are somewhat concerned because there are fears of rising inflation in this environment. And the Fed has stated that it's going to let inflation run hot for a period of time before it actually begins to pull back the reins. And so I wanted to bring you on the podcast today on this particular episode because I know you have been helping clients all over the country prepare for retirement, protect their nest eggs, from all kinds of eroding factors on money, not just inflation. But today we want to focus mm -hmm. upon inflation. What are you hearing from your clients, Mike, right now? Are they worried about inflation? And what are some of the things that individuals can do to protect themselves from your perspective? Uh, yes, uh, to, to answer your question succinctly, uh, we are beginning to hear from a lot of our clients that, that the uh, – the specter of inflation is beginning to, to, to raise uh, its uh, its head, and I think a lot of people, particularly those who are planning to go into their retirement years, are looking at the the uh, negative impact of their of their dollars and its buying power uh, relative to inflation. So that is a great concern that we're beginning to see a lot of people uh, 
uh, talk about. And and what we basically do, Jerry, is is uh, is we can, we have kind of a three pronged approach when it comes to. Uh, you, I, and I don't know that you can necessarily eliminate inflation. It's it's just been here forever, and it's a reality. Uh, it, but I, I think there are ways that you can mitigate against inflation. And and we usually talk to our clients about doing three three things. The first one is we try to get. That our clients, particularly as they're going into their retirement years, positioned in such a way that they're going to be receiving and accessing their retirement dollars in, it, in as a tax-friendly environment as possible. So if there's any way that we can, through our strategies, help them position themselves so that their retirement dollars are either not going to be taxed or going to be taxed at a minimum level, then that's going to help at least mitigate against the, the, the impact of inflation to some degree. Uh, the, the other thing that we recommend that they do is, is per, particularly again as they're approaching their retirement years, is is to eliminate or minimize their debt position. Uh, you know, there, there's basically two types of debt in, in our in our view, and that is there is real estate debt, which is leveraged debt, and that can be used positively to help people. And then there's consumer debt, and and to us, consumer debt is just a black hole. You, you should eliminate that as soon as you possibly can and particularly as you're going into the retirement years if you've got your your levels of debt reduced or are completely eliminated again that's going to be somewhat of a mitigating factor against inflation the third thing that we do is we tell people they should try to make provision for maintaining their long-term health status and that's what a lot of people don't think about that, but as you're going into your retirement years, if you are working against health issues, some of which you can't deal with, but a lot of them you can. Maintaining a good diet, getting good exercise, eating well, and just really taking care of your health, I think is going to also help keep the cost factors, a lot of which the cost factors are, are drastically impacted by inflation uh, at a minimum level. Those are, those are three areas that we think clients have actually got the ability to, to have an impact on what their retirement position looks like as they go into those years of, of uh, not any longer producing income, but, but living off of the dollars that they've accumulated and mitigating against uh, the effects of inflation. That, that's what we basically try to tell our clients. That's pretty powerful. I mean, again, many folks are always looking for that silver bullet, if you will, and it really, mm -hmm. when you when you really think about a financial plan, it's really a coordinated approach. It's a multi-prong yes. approach, just as you've stated. There's not just one thing that you can do to protect yourself. There's many different things. And that last point, Mike, I have to say, is probably one of the most profound. Because as we do age, as we get older, our, our health really, really becomes so important, of course. But the costs, the health care costs, oh. Mike... I mean, yes. uh, you, yes. and you see it every day from your own clients and the stories you hear, but it's simply incredible. And so by having some, many people don't think about that. They think, well, I'll, I'll just find some sort of silver bullet for this, but I can eat the way mm. I want to and not exercise. And then, mm. of course, whatever they did, whatever that silver bullet they thought they had is ruined by their poor health or their poor, exactly right. or their poor tax planning, Mike, or their... Mm. Or they're over leverage in debt. So these are fantastic. Uh, these are fantastic points that people can take and use. Yes. Yeah, we, we, we really find that those are three of the key key areas that if we can get our clients focused on trying to manage those particular areas, you're not going to eliminate inflation. Uh, I don't think anybody can or will, but you can certainly mitigate against its effects. Yes, indeed. Well, I've already uh, heard from you, Mike, that uh, several people have already reached out to you from the podcast from our last uh, time you were on. And I know that people are always you know, looking for advice in this kind of environment that we're in. If folks want to give you a call, Mike, uh, uh, how can they do so? Yeah, the uh, the way our clients or anybody who wants to uh, reach out to us and get some help with some of these issues and, and, and a lot of others would be just simply to call our toll-free number, and that number is 833-370-0777, and uh, we will be happy to get back with them and help in any way possible. That's fantastic. Just give Mike a call, 833-370-0777. Tell him you heard about him here from Follow the Money Radio and Jerry Robinson. And 
could really actually have a big impact upon your financial life. Having a financial plan in this environment, we cannot overstress the importance of that and diversification and many of the things that Mike talked about here on this uh, brief interview. Thanks, Mike, for uh, joining us again. We look forward to having you back on soon. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. Always enjoy it. Thank you. Mike Mitchell is a part of our Christian Advisor Referral Service, and he's here to help you with your retirement needs. If you'd like to reach out to Mike directly, you can call him toll-free, 833-370-0777. That's toll-free, 833 area code, 370-0777. Hey friends, Jerry Robinson here from Follow the Money Radio. Are you a new cryptocurrency investor or considering becoming a cryptocurrency investor? One of the very best cryptocurrencies in my mind for the long term is, of course, Bitcoin. And we have been investing in Bitcoin personally here at Follow the Money since 2013. It has been quite a ride, and we have learned so much over the years owning this asset. And we have just released a brand new video called Bitcoin 101. For those of you who are looking to understand what Bitcoin is, how it works, why it is so attractive to investors, and what the future could hold for this unique asset, this is a must-have video. It's on special right now for a very discounted price, only $7, to give you access to a full hour of education from me, someone who has actually been invested in Bitcoin for more than eight years. So you're going to learn a tremendous amount in this one-hour video. I encourage you to check it out. It's now available in our online store. Simply go to followthemoney.com forward slash shop, and there you will find this brand new Bitcoin 101 video, an hour-long jam-packed with education that you need. Not only do we talk about what Bitcoin is and why it's so attractive to investors, we also talk about our own approach to cryptocurrency investing and how we approach Bitcoin in particular. So you'll really learn a lot. If you know someone who wants to learn more about Bitcoin, if that's you or someone else you know, check out followthemoney.com forward slash shop and get instant access to our brand new Bitcoin 101 video. I know it'll be a great eye-opener for you if you're looking to invest in cryptocurrencies. So go to followthemoney.com forward slash shop and get your Bitcoin 101 video today. Hey friends, this is Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly. Recently, we have been receiving many emails from our listeners commenting on the great help they're getting from our precious metals expert, Tom Cloud. Gold and silver are excellent hedges against the growing threat of coming U.S. inflation. Who's your gold guy? Make it Tom Cloud. With over 30 years' experience with precious metals, Tom will answer all of your questions. Don't buy your gold and silver through some call center and pay inflated prices. Call my good friend Tom Cloud and speak directly with him and get all of your questions answered. For a limited time, Tom is offering free shipping and insurance on every gold and silver purchase made by our listeners. Call 800 247 2812. And when you do, tell him that Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly sent you. And he'll throw in that free shipping and insurance on your entire order. Call your gold guy, Tom Cloud, right now for the very best deals on gold and silver coins. 800-247-2812. That is 800-247-2812. All right, friends, welcome back to the program. We are going to continue now with our new segment called the Follow the Money Book Club. And we're going to continue again with the book Bankruptcy of Our Nation. This is a book that I wrote. We're going to continue again this week with another relevant selection, this time taken from chapter two. I'm going to begin reading at page 32. The title of the chapter is A Short History of Fiat Currencies. Fiat currencies are faith-based currencies. Individuals who live, work, and transact in a fiat currency system are a people of great faith. Faith, you say? What exactly does faith have to do with a fiat currency system? Faith has everything to do with a fiat currency. As we have already learned, a fiat currency system is one determined by the governing authorities with no backing of any physical commodity. Because fiat currencies do not derive their value from anything tangible, their value is determined by their scarcity. Fiat currency systems, like that of the U.S. dollar, demand an enormous amount of trust from the public in the monetary competency of their governments. Why? Because the future value of a fiat currency 
is entirely dependent upon the financial wisdom and vigilant oversight of the nation's monetary authorities in keeping the currency in a limited and strictly measured supply. Those who use and transact in a fiat currency system demonstrate great faith in their government's ability to make sound monetary decisions. If the authorities choose to adopt unsound monetary policies, such as massively inflating the amount of currency in circulation, the public will suffer as each fiat dollar becomes worth less, if not worthless. Under such an irresponsible monetary system, the citizenry will seek to preserve their purchasing power by reducing their holdings in the fiat currency as it declines in value. However, the fiat currency is not always the only casualty in such situations, as the public often loses trust in the entire system, including the current political leaders, the central bank, and even the national banking system. Therefore, it is not a misnomer to call fiat currencies what they truly are, faith-based currencies. The faith expressed by the public is not rooted within the currency itself, but instead within the ability of the nation's monetary authorities to properly steward the value of the fiat currency. Question, is the U.S. dollar the first fiat currency in existence? And if it is not, what kind of historical track record do fiat currencies have? Are fiat currencies more likely to succeed or to fail? Answer, the U.S. dollar is not the first fiat currency in history. In fact, the first known fiat currency system was originated under the Song Dynasty in China during the 11th century. Since the dawn of fiat creation, governments who have chosen to adopt fiat currency systems have had one unfortunate thing in common. They have abused their money printing privileges through the overproduction of their national currency until it becomes completely worthless. Interestingly, a cursory examination of the rationale behind many of these periods of currency collapse begin with reasonable objectives. In other words, it is difficult to find a historical example of a fiat currency collapse that was initiated with sinister motives to destroy the currency. Instead, history demonstrates that the varied periods of currency overproduction occurred when a government became seduced by the suggestion that their economic misfortunes could be solved through the production of just a little more money. But printing money out of thin air, as the fiat currency system so easily allows, always comes at an enormous cost. History is clear. Every fiat currency devised throughout history has faced the same embarrassing and miserable death, utter collapse by overproduction. The fact that so many currency collapses throughout history were initiated under the auspices of good intentions should be a cause for concern to all who distrust the true motives of the monetary authorities in our modern era. A comprehensive historical review of fiat currencies also reveals another interesting phenomenon. Often, just prior to the demise of a fiat currency, the nation's economy appears to be experiencing widespread prosperity. Of course, this prosperity is simply an illusion. In reality, as more of the fiat currency is produced and circulated throughout the national economy, the average standard of living experiences a temporary increase, which creates an illusion of growing wealth in the nation. While this illusion appears real, the prosperity that is encountered by the masses of people is of artificial origin, manufactured and fueled by the government's overproduction of the currency. After a nation experiences this inflation-fueled illusion of prosperity, the death of the currency is not far behind. The irony is cruel. Economics 101 what they didn't teach you in school. Before we begin our brief excursion through history concerning fiat currencies, consider this brief illustration regarding currency overproduction. Imagine for a moment that two brothers, we will call them Bill and Joe, wake up to find themselves stranded on a deserted island. After several attempts to be rescued, the two brothers soon realize that the tropic island may have become their new home. They soon begin surveying the island in search of food, water, and shelter. Bill soon discovers a fruit tree and immediately lays claim to it. Joe, who is literally starving, begs his brother Bill for a piece of fruit. Under normal circumstances, Bill would accept money as payment for his newfound treasure trove. But what good is paper currency on this island? After he realizes that no amount of begging will work on his stingy brother, Joe devises a plan. In his pocket, Joe has eight golf balls. He approaches Bill with the idea of using the eight golf balls as the island's new official currency. 
Bill agrees, and under their new currency system, both men receive four golf balls with which to trade for things that the other man may find. Finally, Joe, who is famished and desperate for food, offers Bill one of his golf balls for a piece of fruit from Bill's tree. Bill considers it a fair trade. Suddenly, as the two men are finalizing their transaction, a very loud noise, like something striking the ground, is heard just a few hundred feet away. Eager to see what has caused the noise, Joe and Bill run to investigate, and what they discover shocks them both. Right there on the white sandy beach in front of them lays a very large wooden crate attached to a parachute. The outside of the box reads, Golf Balls, 100,000 count. Now, considering what we have learned so far, what effect do you think this new box containing 100,000 golf balls is going to have upon the price of the piece of fruit that Joe wants to buy? The answer, the price of Bill's fruit will go up dramatically, and the price increase happens instantaneously as the available money supply on the island, golf balls, has suddenly increased from eight to just over 100,000 in a few brief moments. Given this dramatic increase in the supply of money, in this case golf balls, do you think that Bill is still willing to accept just one golf ball for his precious fruit? Why not 50 or 100 or even 1,000? Interestingly, Bill could not ask for more than eight golf balls for his fruit prior to the discovery of the 100,000 golf balls. And yet, just moments after the discovery of the golf balls, his price could rise immediately. This illustration provides a classic example of the effects that changes in the money supply have on prices within an economy. This is the definition of inflation, an increase in the money supply. Inflation is basically a hidden tax on consumers and will be discussed in further detail in our next chapter. Of course, the government and their paid economists prefer to define inflation as an increase in prices within the economy. However, price increases are only a symptom of the increasing money supply. The reason why governments prefer to define inflation as an increase in prices and not in the money supply is simple. If inflation is simply an increase in prices, then how can anyone blame the government? Instead, we should blame those greedy capitalists and businesses who are always trying to raise prices on consumers. But don't be fooled. Inflation is an increase in the money supply. The only one to blame is the government and their central banking scheme. At its most rudimentary level, our current monetary system shares many similarities with our golf ball illustration. In essence, the more scarce the money supply, the lower the price of goods and services denominated in that currency. But the opposite is also true. The more abundant the money supply, the higher the prices will be for the same goods and services. This is because the amount of money within any economy is directly related to and has a direct effect upon the prices within that economic system. Is milk more expensive? If so, either the dairy business is passing on its higher cost to consumers or more currency has been pumped into the economy. Has bread become more expensive than it used to be? Either the cost of making bread have gone up or the government is allowing more currency to be injected into the economy. Therefore, if the price of everything seems to be going up within a particular economy, ask this question. Is the government increasing the supply of money within the system? In our modern era, the answer is almost always yes, regardless of where you live. When an increase in a nation's money supply or inflation becomes uncontrollable, it is called hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is one of the most dangerous economic problems that can confront a nation as it causes dramatic price increases, which eventually cripple the underlying economy. Unfortunately, hyperinflation has been at the root of nearly every fiat currency system collapse in history. All right, friends, that was a selection, a reading selection from my book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, your financial survival guide. You can pick it up at fine bookstores everywhere. Also on our website, followthemoney.com forward slash bankruptcy. You can also find it on amazon.com and other online stores. And friends, that now brings us to the end of our program. Thank you so much for being here, being a part of today's broadcast. Don't forget, if you're interested in talking to Mike Mitchell to create a financial plan for you and your family, and don't forget, if you're interested in talking with Mike Mitchell, financial advisor, been a financial advisor for nearly 50 years, he's standing by and ready to answer your questions. 
feel free to give them a call, 833-370-0777. Get your financial game plan in order as we head into the rest of a very uncertain 2021. And as always, friends, I like to leave you with a final word, this time just a quote by the famed Will Rogers when he said, invest in inflation. It's the only thing that is going up. And that's just something to think about. Remember, friends, when you want the truth about the global economy, just follow the money. Have a safe and prosperous week, and we'll see you right back here next time. Until then, God bless. Information contained on the Follow the Money podcast is strictly for informational and educational purposes. It should not be construed as specific investment advice. The views and opinions of our guests and sponsors, including Tom Cloud, are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of FTMDaily.com or Robinson Media Group, LLC. Jerry Robinson does hold an insurance license and at times may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products. Follow-up, individualized responses to email or phone requests that involve the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation will not be made absent compliance with state investment advisor registration requirements or an applicable exemption or exclusion and applicable insurance regulations. Past performance is not indicative of future results. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment decision discussed on the podcast. Remember, never do your financial planning through podcast or radio. It's your money. Be wise. Do your due diligence and always always consult a trusted financial professional before making any financial decisions.